Often called one of the wonders of the modern world, the Alaskan Pipeline is an incredible feat of engineering, running over 800 miles from Prudhoe Bay in the north of Alaska to Valdez in the south. The pipeline pumps crude oil at a rate of between 700,000 barrels of oil a day to as many as 2 million, taking almost 12 days to travel the length and breadth of Alaska at a speed of 3.7 miles per hour. Built across some of the most difficult terrain in the world, the pipeline was at the time of its construction known as one of the modern wonders of the world, and its construction was one of the defining feats of modern America. Construction continued through the Alaskan winter and saw temperatures as extreme as negative 70 degrees below zero, and the wilderness the pipeline runs through is so remote that highways had to be built just to get construction crews to their job sites. Before, during, and long after its construction, safety concerns and the fears of environmentalists raged, with many fearing that the pipeline would lead to disastrous spills that would ruin some of the world's last untouched pristine wilderness. And yet to date the Alaskan pipeline has proved to be one of the safest ways of transporting oil ever created, far safer than the alternative of shipping oil through seas filled with crushing ice that could tear a ship to pieces. But the story of the pipeline starts nearly 150 years ago, with whalers in the mid-19th century recognizing the substance the local and Yupiat people called pitch as petroleum. An initial survey of the Alaskan North confirmed petroleum seepage at several different locations, and it was clear that this remote wilderness was literally bursting with oil. However, with difficult terrain and a deadly cold winter, any interest in developing these far-flung oil fields waned at least until after the First World War. With the Navy converting its ships from coal to fuel oil, it became imperative that the United States maintain a strategic reserve of oil in case another major war came along. Thus, President Warren G. Harding established a series of naval petroleum reserves to be set aside for future drilling by the U.S. Navy. These reserves spanned the United States, but some of the largest deposits of oil would be those found throughout Alaska. Out of the Alaskan oil reserves, those located along the northern coast would prove to be the most substantial, rivaling in size those located in Texas or the Middle East. Sending geologists to gauge the true petroleum and coal wealth of Alaska, the U.S. Geological Survey mapped northern Alaska between 1923 and 1925, confirming that the land held rich reserves of coal and oil both. However, the daunting challenge posed by Alaska's fierce winters delayed any exploitation of these reserves until after World War II, when in 1944 the U.S. Navy funded exploration for oil all along the Brooks Range. Discovering several oil fields, the sheer difficulty presented by Alaska's weather and remoteness both once more discouraged their exploitation. Oil could be more easily pumped out of the ground in the milder climates of the lower 48, or even in the less adverse weather conditions in Canada. For the immediate future, the pristine wilderness of Alaska would be protected by its remoteness and brutally cold winter. Yet commercial exploitation of oil fields in southern Alaska eventually drew great interest to the state and its staggering reserves of oil. Northern Alaska held some of the world's largest reserves of oil, but the issue of transporting it out of the region remained. Fearing a Japanese invasion into Canada and then into the United States via Alaska, the United States Army Corps of Engineers had constructed the Alaskan Highway during World War II. Up until that point, no true roads ran from the lower 48 states of the U.S. to Alaska, and all travel was via air or ship. The new highway ensured that large numbers of troops could be quickly dispatched to head off a Japanese invasion, but in peacetime it could be used to link the far north with the rest of the U.S.'s economy. Yet Alaska was still incredibly remote, and the only major commercial seaports were on the southeast end of the state, where the ocean remained largely ice-free even during the bitter winter. Up north, however, the sea would lock down any port with thick ice for the majority of the year, leaving only a short summer season for ships to get in and out. A solution for pumping the incredible wealth of northern Alaska out of the ground was desperately needed. The first and most obvious solution was the creation of a transport pipeline. Yet at the time, no pipeline in the world had ever been built that equaled the length of the one needed to cross the entirety of Alaska. Engineers feared that it was at present an unsurpassable technical challenge. Oil would not only have to be transported almost a thousand miles, but it would have to be heated up during the winter to keep the pipe flowing. The technical challenges were staggering, and so alternatives were sought out. Boeing proposed building a fleet of gigantic 12-engine tanker aircraft, which would fly oil from the fields to southern ports, but no fleet of planes would be able to fly enough oil fast enough to make the enterprise commercially viable. 
General Dynamics, builders of many of the Navy's high-tech submarines, proposed building a fleet of tanker submarines, which would travel under the Arctic ice cap. But that too was deemed too risky and cost ineffective. Yet another proposal involved extending the Alaskan Railroad all the way up north to Prudhoe Bay, which was appealing, but still that didn't provide enough transport capability to be truly profitable. Lastly, a fleet of ice-breaking oil tankers were proposed, and fresh out of options were ultimately seen as the most realistic and economically feasible idea. Thus, the Humble Oil and Refining Company sent a specially fitted oil tanker, the SS Manhattan, up north to test the feasibility of transporting oil via ice-breaking tankers. The Manhattan was a powerful ship fitted with an ice-breaking bow, powerful engines, and hardened propellers to resist being crushed by ice flows. However, during its test run through the Northwest Passage from the Atlantic to the Beaufort Sea, the ship suffered damage to several cargo holds, which quickly flooded with seawater, and wind-blown ice forced the Manhattan to change course. Ultimately, it was escorted to safety by the Canadian icebreaker the CCGS, John A. Macdonald. Transporting oil out of the remote north via oil tanker was simply too risky, and so it was back to the original idea, figure out how to build the, at the time, world's longest pipeline. Even before the SS Manhattan had left its home port for the exploratory run through the north, though, the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline System, or TAPS, had already been formed from a coalition of ARCO, British Petroleum, and Humble Oil. In 1969, TAPS asked permission from the U.S.'s Department of the Interior to begin geological and engineering studies of the proposed pipeline route. But even before these feasibility studies had begun, the three oil companies had already chosen a route for the pipeline, planning to simply bury the pipeline as was standard everywhere around the world. Work was set to begin when the Interior Department sent personnel to analyze both the proposed route and the oil company's plans. The investigation quickly discovered that the route and the choice to simply bury the pipeline was completely unfeasible, as the hot oil running through the buried pipeline would heat the permafrost around it and the pipeline would fail, spilling millions of barrels of oil in the process. The oil company engineers had underestimated the difficulty of digging in the frozen permafrost and completely ignored the ramifications of heating that permafrost with hot oil. It was clear that the oil companies had rushed their preparations in anticipation of having the pipeline operational by late 1969. Just months after beginning construction, a notion labeled as ludicrous by the Interior Department personnel. These fundamental engineering issues along with the claims by local natives demanding compensation for the pipeline to pass through their lands brought along a freeze on any construction. Meanwhile, conservationists rallied against the pipeline, claiming that Alaska was a pristine and untouched wilderness that should remain so. Spurred by these protests, the Interior Department forced the oil companies to undertake an environmental impact study for the proposed pipeline, a move that further delayed construction and added greatly to the cost of the project. For three years, conservationists and Alaskan natives successfully blocked construction of the pipeline, winning several major concessions from the oil companies to include crossing points for caribou herds and money to help protect native species. However, on October 17, 1973, the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries announced an oil embargo against the U.S. in retaliation for its support of Israel during the Yom Kippur War. Importing 35% of its oil from foreign sources, the U.S. was hard hit and gasoline prices skyrocketed resulting in severe shortages across the nation. The American people demanded an answer, and two weeks later the U.S. Congress approved the immediate construction of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, removing all legal blocks to its construction. At last, after almost four years of delays and tens of millions of dollars invested, the oil companies were free to start construction, and in March of 1974 work officially began on the massive pipeline. Work would go on year-round, with workers facing brutally cold conditions and months of perpetual dark in the Alaskan winter. Yet the pipeline offered wages up to three times the national average, and a modern-day gold rush began as men and women from all over the United States rushed up north to work on the pipeline. So great was the influx of workers that towns across the formerly remote Alaskan wilderness boomed in population. With the population in Valdez exploding from 1,350 in 1974 to 8,253 just two years later, along with the increase in population though came an explosion of crime. Everything from theft to murder to prostitution, and in many towns criminal elements set themselves up to cater to the illicit needs of pipeline workers flush with cash. 
The sale of drugs, alcohol, which was illegal for pipeline workers by order of the oil companies, and sex boomed in towns along the construction route, and eventually organized crime had penetrated deep into the very bones of the massive project. The theft of huge amounts of construction equipment, materials, and even brand new trucks was not uncommon. Yet the oil companies were so deeply invested by this point and eager for construction to be done that they simply absorbed the losses. Ultimately though, the pipeline would be completed in 1977, and the first barrel of oil reached Valdez on July 28, 1977. For three years, tens of thousands of people labored in some of the greatest temperature extremes on the planet, and total construction costs would come up at over $8 billion. However, the pipeline would see the successful and safe extraction of billions of barrels of oil that would have remained locked up for decades without its construction, and ensure America's need for oil could be met in the event of international emergencies. Today though, the pipeline's daily output has fallen to a trickle of its former output, as fields in North Alaska are drying up. Unless new fields are developed, the pipeline will inevitably close, though ongoing development could see it last for as far as 2075. Would you have risked working in the Alaskan wilderness to build this incredible pipeline? Also check out our other video, Soldiers Caught in the Kajaki Landmine Trap. As always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.